G'day guys, Jeff here. Thanks for tuning in. This is 15 Minutes in the Brewery, and today I'm going to be talking about this particular beer right here, and I'm also going to be talking about my current lager fermentation, and if I get a little bit of time, I'm going to be speaking about some details regarding my fermenters. So firstly, I want to talk about this particular beer here, and as I show you a pour, this beer is now about five minutes in the glass, five or six minutes, and you can see the head's pretty much dissipated. It doesn't have a really thick head. It's um, got a beautiful color though. It's, from where I am, it's, because uh, I don't know if the camera can see how it looks to my eye, but it's quite a golden color. Golden, pale golden, maybe slight straw golden, something like that. Um, uh, this is about 4.95%. And this was meant to be a Pilsner with lemons in it. So it was meant to be a lemon Pilsner. I did some brew footage, or brew day footage I should say, of this particular beer when I brewed it. Um, and I brewed this beer because last year I brewed a lemon Kolsch, and the lemon Kolsch was really nice. It turned out really nice. Uh, the Kolsch was just, I think, standard Kolsch yeast, um, Hallertau hops, and I put lemons in uh, lemon peel, but I peeled off, I think 50 grams from memory at the end. And it was really nice. The beer was great. It had a little bit of like a lemonade-y uh, thing going on in the background. It was really nice. I enjoyed it, the wife enjoyed it. Um, so I thought I'd do the same thing again, but as a Pilsner. Now, this was supposed to be a really good beer. I made a big mistake with this beer though. But before I do, I'm just gonna go in, I'm just gonna tell you what it smells like. So it smells like Lemons, like it does, it really does smell like lemons. Lemons are kind of lemony, lemonade a little bit, but mostly lemons. But the problem is it smells quite pithy, like lemon pith, like the rind. And the reason, there's a reason why it smells like lemon rind, which I'll get to in again in a minute, but I'm gonna have a taste first, let you know what it tastes like. It's mellowed down quite a lot. Um, when, I, when I first kegged this, within the first two weeks, this was almost undrinkable. Um, it was so astringent from the lemon pith, the lemon rind. It really, it just took over the beer and it kind of wiped everything else out. And even now, though, the, it, although the um, that's kind of settled down, uh, it still leaves you with a really kind of a semi-astringent dryness in your mouth afterwards. Now, the mistake I made with this beer was I accidentally put the lemon rinds in while it was boiling. I don't know why, but on brew day, I, for some reason I thought, oh, I think I put them in when it was boiling last time. So with five minutes to go, I lumped 150 grams of lemon peel into this batch, which was three times more than my Kolsch. And it wasn't until afterwards I realized with the Kolsch, I actually put the lemon peel in as a Whirlpool addition. Um, it wasn't boiling, so I didn't boil those lemon peels at all. They basically just soaked in there. Uh, and by boiling them, I'm pretty sure that's how I've gotten this really super astringent dryness, pithiness that really overtakes this beer. Now, I, pro I probably should, honestly, I probably should just start again, just tip it and start again. But I can't, I don't know, I just have trouble bringing myself to tip, actual tip beers, you know? Like, I, I really struggle to tip beers out unless they taste like shit, like, like actual vomit or like I had one recently which is a whole nother story, which was a sulfur dioxide bomb. Like when you smelled it, it was like rotten eggs. It was that bad, um, but that's another story. That one, straight down the sink, no dramas, wasn't even gonna try. But this one, I don't know. I don't know whether it's, I feel like I need to punish myself for the mistake I made and just drink it. But I have been mixing it with some other beers, some other lighter beers. And it actually, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you still get that dryness and that pithiness and the astringency but it's it's stole down a bit like i'm ruining better beers to you know with a i don't know some people say that some people say why bother you're just ruining a good beer by putting a, a less than average beer in yeah, yeah i don't know I, I still have trouble tipping beers out if they're remotely drinkable i'll drink them you know if, if it's like an infection i'm not going to obviously drink them so anyway what I put in that uh, grain bill, if I can quickly find it in my brew book, uh, it was quite recent. 
Well, I put, so here it is. So I put Pilsner, Vienna, Munich, and Toffee Malt, all from Gladfields. Now I've used Toffee Malt before. I put Toffee, toffee Malt in a Pilsner last year, uh, but I put too much in, and I got a really strong honey flavor in the beer. It was actually a little bit too sweet. It was a little bit, uh, what do you call it, oversweet. And, um, and I thought to myself at the time, I thought, man, that would probably really pair well with lemons, that kind of honey that probably bounce off each other. Not like a cough lolly, I wasn't thinking like a cough lolly, but the, 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 the flavor at the time made me think maybe if there was a little bit of lemon in there that would really bounce off it if it wasn't so sweet, etc. So that's how this beer originated. Uh, I thought I'd do it as a Pilsner. It was W3470 yeast. Um, and it was three kilos of Pils malt, 700 grams of Vienna, 200 grams of Munich, and 100 grams of toffee malt. Uh, Magna for bittering, middle through at 10 minutes and zero minutes, and the little lemon peel at five minutes, unfortunately, which was supposed to be a, a whirlpool addition uh, after it had dropped down a little bit. And oh, sorry, the yeast was diamond lager yeast. Two packets of diamond lager yeast, which I got a lot of sulfur from. Um, I actually got more sulfur using diamond lager yeast than I have using Safale. 3470 but again that's another that's another video i'm not sure if there's I mean, they're supposed to be the same yeast but i seem to get way more sulfur output when i'm using diamond as opposed to actually using saf lager w3470 anyway so yeah um back to the drawing board with this beer um, i'm not going to brew it again for a while because quite frankly i've just a little bit over the the pithy lemonist now and and i've currently got a beer in the fermenter which is what i want to talk about after this, so one more sip. You know, everything else about this beer is good. The bitterness is great. The mouth feels perfect. I mean, it's crystal clear. I mean, it is absolutely crystal clear. I mean, it looks the business, and then you taste it, which is quite sad. All right, so the current beer I'm fermenting is now, it's kind of a Rush's Pilsner clone, but it's not really. No, and I'll qualify that by saying that um, my father-in-law loves Rush's Pilsner. So I've been trying to make a beer which comes pretty close with that bitterness and that kind of flavor profile. Rush's Pilsner to me kind of comes off, comes off as 90% Pilsner and about 10% Vienna. I think there's Vienna in there. I get a little bit of something like Vienna when I drink a Rush's Pilsner. And um, so that's what I, the recipe I kind of go for. I go for uh, 3.4 kilos of Pilsner, 400 of Gladfield Vienna. I put a little bit of Munich in it though, just to push the color. So 200 grams of Munich and 100 grams of Carapils. Now I only put the Carapils in because I bought a bag for some reason, I don't know why, and I just don't want to waste it. So I put 100 grams in because I mean Carapils will add a little bit of extra sweetness it's probably going to take it away from a Russia's Pilsner. It's probably going to be a little bit sweeter and a little bit more malty than an actual Russia's Pilsner. And, uh, but you know, that's, that's, that's kind of what I was aiming for. I'm probably overshooting it and I probably need to dial it right back. But that's, that's another story as well, I guess. Um, but what I wanted to talk about in regards to this particular beer is fermentation schedule. Now, for my lagers, I've, I've fermented lagers at pretty much every temperature regime that is listed anywhere on the internet so you think of any regime with any step temperatures and spikes for diacetyl rests and you know, whatever starting cold starting warm starting really hot under pressure no pressure excuse me i've done pretty much everything and um and what i've found is I find, like people say there's no difference between a hot fermented lager under pressure or a hot fermented lager with no pressure and, oh, my kids are here. Hang on, I've got to pause. Yes. Yes. Do you want me to make it? No, who are you talking to? To the camera. You're on YouTube. Oh. Uh, do you need me to make it or are you good? Uh, well, you should have just made it. Why just? Did you love it when your kids come and ask you for something they can normally have? You know, uh, only when I'm recording too, by the way. So, um, so fermentation schedules. Let's get back into it. Fermentation schedules. Um, 
So I've tried them all, and, and, and I know people say there's no difference between a warm fermented lager and a cold fermented lager, etc., etc. Um, I have found differences, but that's probably because of other reasons, like differences in the processes and differences in the ingredients, and they're not the same lager, not the same yeast. Uh, so it's, it's, there's nothing really you can, I can take out of my experience so far that I can tie together and say uh, definitively anything, to be honest. But um, but what I've found is, I think a lot of people want to ferment lagers fast because they, if you ferment them cold, they do take a lot of time. That's just how it is. It's, it's just, uh, you ferment anything cold, it's, the yeast slows down, that those metabolic processes slow down, and the whole, thing's gonna, the whole thing is just going to take a little bit longer. But that's just how it is. Uh, and that's how it always has been with lagers. Now, that recently, I mean recently as in the last 40, 50 years, even the commercial breweries now speed up their processes and ferment their lagers at much warmer temperatures and condition them for much less than what probably would traditionally be done in Germany in caves or wherever they put these beers to supposedly lager. Uh, so there is, there's no real kind of professional or right or wrong way of doing it. There is a traditional way of doing it. There are more modern ways of doing it. Um, and there's a lot of different ways of doing it. So with this particular lager, what I'm doing at the moment is I'm just going flat line, cold ferment, 9.5 degrees Celsius. That's what I've set it at. Uh, we're up to, we're on day uh, 10 of fermentation. The ferment has pretty much just stopped in the last 24 hours or so. It's just trickling over now. So it's been about 10 days and that's pretty slow. And, but you know, compared to an ale, I guess, it's pretty slow. Compared to Kvake or Kvike, it's just like, I could have probably fermented three beers in the same amount of time as it's taken me to do one lager. But for me, um, when it comes to m m the lagers that I like to drink, when it comes to what I do in my fridge with my fermentations, um, I pretty much think you can do whatever you want. Now, I know there's a lot of people out there who say, oh, don't, don't worry, bother, just do it fast. You can't taste the difference, etc., etc." And if you tell people online, if you go into a Facebook group and, and post and say that you're fermenting a lager and it's taken 24 days and you've done it at eight or nine degrees Celsius, most people will tell you if you're an idiot. And I'll say, oh, what are you doing it like that for? You should be going fast. You should, you should be doing it at 18. You know you can't taste the difference between 18 and eight degrees and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and you probably can't. But I've got the time. And I kind of like the idea of doing things in a way that would have been done at one point in history. Um, I kind of feel an affinity with brewers in years past when I kind of do processes like this, like a cold fermentation like this. That's probably more akin to what would have been done traditionally. Um, and I just enjoy doing that. I don't have a rush on my fermenting fridge at the moment. I've got plenty of beer in the old keg fridge here. I don't need another two beers to pump out straight away. I'm not that much of an alcoholic. I'm, you know, I'm, I drink fairly often, but I don't drink that much. And it's just me and my wife who are drinking. I don't have a lot of mates who come over and, you know, and bludge all the beers off me. So um, it's just me and the wife and occasionally the father-in-law and occasionally a mate or two will drop in um, and possibly have one, but that's about it. So for me, I just don't have that rush. I don't have that need to get my fermenting fridge empty quickly so i actually enjoy fermenting these lagers quite slowly and what i have found in my experience i think this is where i'm guess where this is probably where i'm going with this whole um, discussion here um, is that when i ferment warmer when i ferment say if i do a 15c under a little bit of pressure if i do it at 18c under 15 psi or 20c with w3470 what i find is yes it does burn through really quick i can your fermentation is done in four days uh, but I do find it needs time to settle out and to really uh, just kind of lager out, I guess, and condition before it tastes, you know, as crisp and clean as you really want. Um, and when I ferment them cold, I actually find that I can drink them quicker. They don't seem to pump out as much of those uh, byproducts when they're fermenting slowly as they do when they're fermenting hot. Uh, granted, that stuff all gets blown out of the fermenter mostly anyway, but I just found in my experience, the cold ferments that I've done, I've been able to drink the beers and enjoy them um, straight after like 20 days or 24 days of conditioning. Whereas when I do them warm, I do find that I prefer to leave them in the keg for a week or two before I start drinking them. And that brings me to the whole idea of 
do you condition in the keg and bring your lagers kind of condition them into uh, that, that kind of um, serving condition that you want to drink do you do that in the keg in the fridge or do you just spend a little bit of extra time fermenting them cold and that's entirely up to you that's 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 the beauty of home brewing we can do whatever the heck we want you know if I want to ferment this lager at six degrees you know and it takes me two weeks just for the primary fermentation I can do that um, if I've got the time I mean what else am I going to do if I don't have or don't need the beer like I, what else am I going to do with my fermenting fridge I might as well have something in there so uh, and I can only fit so many kegs in this other fridge and I can only drink so much beer so I enjoy fermenting things slow and the experiment this time see in the past I've done uh, fermentations the coldest I've started at is uh, seven and a half degrees Celsius and it took 48 hours to kick off but that was actually a really nice beer that was one of my favorite lagers so far. I started at seven and a half. Uh, I did two or three days at seven and a half, and then I slowly started to ramp it up half a degree a day until I think I got to about 11 degrees on that one. And then I stopped and then I crashed it slowly um, because I wanted to reuse the yeast. And that's another, that's another video right there too. Do you crash slow or do you crash fast with your lagers or with any beer for that matter? Um, does it do anything to the beer? Do those yeast crashing fast? Does you know, pissing your beer, basically, all this byproducts, apparently, that some people claim. I don't know, I've no idea, to be honest, but I have to admit, when I cold crash my lagers, I do tend to do it slowly, probably half a degree a day, which is also a lot why, when I, I ferment, I like to ferment a bit colder, because that way I'm not too far up the temperature spectrum that I can crash back down fairly quickly. So if I was at 15C for a diacetyl rest, and I wanted to um, crash it down slowly, say half a, or one degree Celsius per day, uh, that's gonna take a lot longer than it does if I'm only at 10 or 11 degrees. You know, there's four to six days at least there extra just in that slow crashing time. Now, whether that or, or not that does something to the beer or not, I'm not 100% sure, but what I do know is the first time I, I fermented at a really low temperature, I started, like I said, I started at seven and a half degrees. I think I got up to about 11C, and then I slowly brought that down, and I put the spunding valve up to about 15 psi. And what I found was that beer kept fermenting all the way down. Like it was amazing. It, the yeast was active all the way down through that cold period until I think about five degrees, and then it was really starting to drop out and clear up, etc. Um, but there's something to that, and there is a thing where the, there is a process or a lager brewing process that the Germans did where they would brew very cold at 8C maximum, I think. Um, and they would just run it at that temperature for two weeks, and then they would spun it and slowly bring it down. And they bring it down so slowly that the yeast stays active throughout the entire period, and it's cleaning up the beer, even though the beer is quite cold comparatively. So that's what I'm doing at the moment. Um, I'm excited to see how that lager turns out. I, I've only got this lager at the moment, which I'm not that happy with. So it'd be nice to have another crisp lager in the fridge that doesn't taste like uh, lemon rind and astringency. You know, this is, um, it's nice-ish if you like, you know, really dry astringent uh, lemon peel beers. It's pretty good. And if you want to beer, brew a beer that's super astringent, I recommend a crap ton of uh, lemon peel at about 10 minutes left, just whack it in there and you'll get the most astringent beer on planet Earth. That's enough talking. That's probably more than 15 minutes in the brewery today. Uh, thanks for tuning in. And I hope you tune in again next time when I do another 15 minutes in the brewery. Hopefully I can do this more often, more regularly. Um, just sit down and chat about what I'm doing and talk about the Brit beers and also the recipes. And hopefully I can talk about some of the, the recipe development and the ideas that go through my head when I'm thinking of the recipes that I create for my homebrew. Otherwise, cheers. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time. That was pretty good. Just be yourself, my friend.